So let's leave it up to Max to start the conversation about how he sees the issue of utopians in science fiction and science facts and take it from there with an open um, audience discussion. But please raise your hand first and then we'll pass you the mic and that'll make it easier on you as well. Thank you. Actually, I'm gonna take advantage of this to just make a quick comment on something that Kim said, that was very interesting, and see if I can make that connect to the general talk of, of utopia. Um, Kim suggested that we will always be human and cast some doubt on the term transhuman or transhumanism. And uh, we talked a little bit out in the corridor and I was saying, I, I, I tend to stick to the word transhuman. I don't call myself a transhuman because if I do that, other people are gonna say, oh, you snooty bastard. Yeah. <laughs> so, you're saying I'm human, but you're transhuman. So I think it would have yeah. that divisive effect, but I don't think the same is true of transhumanism, just like humanism. Um, you know, people are not humanists, you're not saying they're not human beings. I, to me, that's an aspirational philosophy that applies to everybody, so I don't have that problem. And I do think that there will become a point at which it becomes perfectly sensible to say we will not be human. If you define a species by essentially its genetic nature, interbreedability, and so on, it could well be a point at which we're so radically different, especially if we actually are uploaded, we don't even have DNA anymore. To me, just kind of a biological, historical sense, it seems to make sense to say we wouldn't actually be human beings. Now, of course, there are some... Uh, drawbacks to that, and that's maybe why Ray Kurzweil doesn't call himself a transhumanist. Uh, uh, I think post-human is, is, is worse from that point of view. It sounds like mm. after human, to humans are gone and they've been replaced. Transhumanism doesn't have that implication to me at least. It's a transition. Uh, transition to, and here's the connection, to a, uh, a not quite utopian, but a better future. Uh, it's basically saying that we've got these amazing bodies and brains. They're really pretty amazing things. How on earth could that actually come about? But they're also not that great. They have all these problems and defects. They tend to suffer a lot of pain and unhappiness, and they break down. So why can't we radically transform those? Why can't we become something better than we are from our own values? Not all the same, becoming better in the same way, but according to our own values. Uh, so that's my, my sliding into the BJ. utopian theme. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to address the same issue and say that for years I've been saying the same thing that Kim has. So thank you so much because in this community I felt like a very lone voice. But the fact that I don't call myself a transhuman or, tra or refer to transhumanism precisely because we already are. We have been for tens of thousands of years. We will continue to be. And that's to me what the glory of this community is, is that we actually recognize that we're neither the beginning point nor the end point but a, on a long journey of what it means to be human. Uh, so thank you, you really made my day. <laughs> Heretic, persecutor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm gonna agree with Max, <laughs> um, because I come out of the left, I agree for you, with you for different reasons. Um, I come out of the left, and the struggle on the left has always been, well, you don't want to be associated with Stalin. So you say, I'm, I'm for uh, trade unions and progressive taxation and universal health insurance and international labor solidarity and uh, you know, women's rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people, people say, okay, so what do you call yourself? Oh, I'm a progressive. No, not really. You know, there's, there's a history to the things that you just said, and it's not actually progressive, it's actually socialist. Um, and so I'm part, you know, I've been struggling with that since I was a teenager, that um, you might as well either accept the fact that people are gonna constantly call you socialist and you're gonna constantly be saying, no, I'm an economic progressive or blah, 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 or you're gonna fight the fight to try to rehabilitate, reclaim, and validate the term that you actually are associated with. Can I, ju can I just fight the fight and not call myself something? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I uh, would uh, reiterate, I guess my, my PI has a lot of PI, which is to say my principal investigator has a lot of uh, personal incredulity. I like this new um, PI version, and I don't know why that is, but I don't think that the uh, um, brain is uh, salvageable or uh, uploadable or downloadable. Um, and I also don't think that we, our sense of ourselves, our consciousness is uh, separate from our entire body. That it is not a matter of the brain, but it is a matter of everything uh, out to your skin and then in an interaction with everything else. So I, now, I, I may be wrong about all this. This is just a, s a set of uh, impressions that come out of the, uh, the data that I'm given, which is the information that I get from everybody else, including people who are more expert in these fields than I am. Who, believe things that uh, my PI index uh, gets crossed and I don't believe it. Uh, although I'm interested in the idea that 
if we solved the necessary problems, we might get to a sufficiency to where we can take on the next set of problems and, and, and push at these, uh, at these areas that are obviously problematic and at the edge of the possible one way or another. So um, they, and, and as a science fiction writer, I'm very open to the idea that we um, talk about the future and that we talk about it in the nature of a project, that the project is an existential state that has a future component in it, so we all have our own project. When you've got your project, it has a big futurity. The shadow of the future uh, 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 comes back in and influences what we decide in the presence, and it's a necessary part of decision making to have a vision of the future. So um, I'm happy to see these other visions of the future, and they often, it, it boggles my mind uh, what, what people are up to, and it's uh, kind of a beautiful thing. I'd like to um, clarify something here. When we use the term transhumanism, we're using it in a philosophical perspective. And so isms, whether we like them or not, represent a particular philosophical ideation of, of concepts and puts them together in ways that are best understood within the genre and within the, the field that they're discussed. Just like when we discuss science, for example, whether it's artificial general intelligence or biotechnology or space exploration, we preface it within the field and use the terminology most appropriate to express those ideas. So transhumanism is a philosophical worldview. Whether or not one calls him or herself a transhuman, a posthuman, a cyborg is secondary. That's more of an individual decision-making process. But let's take, take a look at the, the concept of utopias. Um, James, you um, talked yesterday about myths and utopias. Could you lead the discussion here briefly and maybe present a, um, a question to the other panel members? Well, I, I was curious what um, Stan thought about my uh, proposal that we needed to accept the, the original cyberpunk challenge, which is that utopianism, flat out utopianism, sounds and looks pretty hokey, you know, in the sense of like the, the uh, looking backward and, and some of those original utopian visions, and flat to our contemporary sensibility. And that what we need is a grittier, more complex, um, I still think it has a utopian dimension to it, but it's, it's a kind of post-utopian in the sense that it's not just trying to say that everything's gonna be groovy, it, it's, uh, it really is complex. Sure. Just very quickly, coming on that, I've never liked the term utopia, and I sometimes use the term extropia based on the concept of extropy because utopia is really a dead end, whereas extropia, it's supposed to be a process of continual improvement. Well, I would define utopia the way you're defining extropia, so it's a matter of semantics in a way, but the utopian tradition is um, um, transformed by the work of H.G. Wells so that the cyberpunks were uh, really critiquing it, and very often you get anti-utopian remarks from people who are doing a defense of the status quo one way or another, and usually they're capitalist defenses. And it's a, so to be anti-utopian is to be anti-socialist, which is to be anti-Satanist, which anti-demonic, and therefore it's obvious you need to be anti-utopian because nobody would be in favor of the devil. So then you have to define utopianism as a drive towards a static end state. And this is what H.G. Wells uh, uh, made such a, a lifelong attempt to redefine utopia as a dynamic uh, name, a name for a dynamic course in history where things are getting better than they were before by the, by the intentional efforts of humanity taken at large as a civilization. So utopianism at that point is just uh, 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 congruent with progressivism and with all of the notions that we can actually seize history, which since the 18th century has been part of the human project, that human history is something that we can collectively aim in one direction or another. And I'm saying when we've aimed it in a positive direction, we're already in a utopian proto-state. And so this is the way that I def define utopianism, where it can be it necessarily has to be gritty or problematic or filled with reversals and oppositions and stepwise progress and maybe lack of progress in other areas, uh, uneven progress, etc. Ah, uh, yes, we have a question from the audience. Uh, it, it is clear that words matter uh, from your brief uh, discussion as well. Uh, and. Uh, whether we can agree how to define them or, or, or not, it is the actionability and the fruitfulness, the generative capacity of our words that actually transform into action and turn fiction into fact, uh, uh, transforming society uh, through technology. 
uh, also our uh, moral choices applicable to what can be done define uh, the future and define the shape of, of, of society. We had, we had examples in the past, clearly, where, for example, uh, black people being property uh, were <laughs> not uh, endowed with the rights that others had, and then we changed our minds, and, and now we live in a very, very different world. And in a very near future, we will have questions about what uh, new rights and moral decisions as a consequence we will need to endow, for example, Google cars with, who, which will have to decide who to save, who to kill shortly on, on the roads, uh, statistically unavoidably. What are the rights that you think are coming <laughs> closer and closer that will extend the choices that our society gives? We're doing a conference, just putting it on a little plug, um, at Yale in March called The Rights of the Non-Human Person. And uh, this is a, a central topic for us, the ways in which the boundary between human and animal um, should already be abrogated by the recognition that gradients and, uh, and uh, elephants and cetaceans have sufficient psychological characteristics to be accorded a broader swath of rights. Um, and then I think that what's in the very near future, now that we've decoded the genomes of, of simians and, and uh, great apes and, and other species, and begun to identify the, the sequences that have created the neurological structures that give us what we consider to be unique characteristics, is the prospect that David Brin has explored in his work of uplift of, of the intentional creation of other cognitive and communicative capacities in animals, and that will even further push that particular challenge to the race uh, paradigm. I think this gets back to the whole issue of what are the stories we're telling, what are the myths we're telling, it's why we're all here. We've always taken stories and expanded the moral universe to include whoever the underdog is. So whether it started with women and children, racial minorities, homosexuality, stories have actually exposed the inner lives of these people and made people go, wow, they're just like me. So we're going to have exactly stories about what James is talking about. We're gonna have more and more stories about the inner lives of creatures who are not human, who may not even be uh, biological. And once we can tell those inner stories, you're gonna see the moral arrow shift once more, as it always does, as you include greater and greater numbers in, in an inclusive circle of who is us? Who do we consider part of our tribe? Who do we consider part of those we can relate to? And once we can tell those stories, you'll have achieved that goal. Apart from, uh, I agree with everything that's been said here, but and apart from extending rights to new entities, whether it's <coughs> AIs or uh, hybrids or whatever, there's also the issue of um, how do we extend rights as our, our personalities can project themselves on the world in different ways. For instance, if we have some kind of intelligent agents that we can program to answer our phone calls and even enter into contracts with us or deal with parts of our business, where do we say you know, the line is drawn? Am I responsible for something my agent did or said? To what extent am I responsible? Am I just as responsible if I did it physically and personally? Uh, so that, that's going to be, I think, a very live issue right now. I mean, it already exists because we already have agency questions now, but it's going to become, I think, drastically more so with our, our massive uh, data-filled, distracted lives, we're going to be very much welcoming these kinds of personal agents. So I think that's going to be another area of the expansion of rights has to be thought about very carefully. <coughs> it seems to me we still haven't enacted the UN Declaration of Human Rights that all the nations have signed that are in the UN, and so that's an un unfinished project. And uh, you could uh, quickly, as a corollary of the, uh, that Declaration of Human Rights, get into the notion of the physical world as a commons and not as private property, so that the physical world is a public utility there for the good of all. So that one of the rights you might say is a sufficiency, or a right to one seven billionth of human productivity, or human resources, or natural resources. And that when you begin to do that, you get into a rights situation of, that we're nowhere near close to. So it isn't as if we need to go hunting for uh, new rights to create for uh, 
even animals, but all, especially for created um, artificial intelligences and the like, we need to uh, finish the project of, of uh, justice. And that, that would it involve um, everybody having the right to food, water, shelter, clothing, health care, and education. So once we've got all seven billion with those things, and it was so inspiring to hear uh, Fred Stitz talk about free higher education for all, because that is coming, you can see it, and it's going to be transformative, just as he said. So um, some of these things are coming. Others, like healthcare, as it gets more and more expensive, and as it is a capitalist enterprise that is looking to make profit, it looks to the, the people with the most money to pay for incremental in, uh, increases in health that have to do with statistical clinical trials that don't even have to do with individuals, but with numbers, insurance companies. In other words, the old Italian workers saying that health is not for sale is ludicrously wrong and unenacted. Uh, the idea that health also is a right that we need to be uh, giving to everybody on the planet. But let's preface that with it's a, I'm going back to the quantified self. It's a self-responsibility to be in good health. Doctors do need to make a living as well. They have high overhead, high expenses. Coming from a family of physicians <coughs> who you would think are millionaires, they're not millionaires. They may make millions of dollars per year, but the money that goes out to the volunteer work they do in helping other people and paying for their staff and paying for all their expenses brings it down so my brother makes no money, more money than I. We have a question over here. Yeah, I'm just going to say that I actually disagree with what Kim said. I don't see those kinds of things as rights. I think those are great things to do, and it's great to have free education if we can provide that, but I don't actually regard those as rights. Uh, but that's a whole positive negative rights discussion that's be a big distraction, so that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate the, the political grounding of some of this morning's talks. Um, and then uh, the theme of the conference is, is writing the future. And part of that writing is journalism. So I'm in the press, and I was fascinated by Aubrey de Grey. You know, basically his whole talk was about um, about PR. So in this utopian future, um, how is PR and science getting along better? I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but I hope you can pick up on that. Yes, PJ, do you want to? I. Uh, no, I'm going to pass on that one. All right. <laughs> That's a really fraught issue. And as someone who many lifetimes ago did PR, so much of it is wrapped up in money. Mm -hmm. The issue becomes how do scientists communicate their work, their knowledge, and not run up against regulatory commissions, funding bodies, FDA, if I say I have something that I can extrapolate, I have a therapy that I can extrapolate to something beyond the therapy, you will never get past the FDA. You will lose your funding because the extra, unless you are so at the top of your game that you can ignore it, you're so famous that people can go, oh, he's doing that again, isn't that fabulous? Um, that you, they can brush it off because they're that powerful and that famous in their field. Otherwise, they're terrified. The number of people who find out that you're going to write about their research and literally run away, the vast majority of scientists. Um, I, uh, I hesitate to bring this up in here, but I was lucky enough to get a tour of the National Ignition Facility, not too far from here, <coughs> Lawrence Livermore. What an extraordinary experience. By the way, if any of you. <laughs> the best place to kill James Bond, if you were Yes, 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 best place to kill James Bond, totally. Um, anyone can go. Anybody in this room can say, hey, when's there a tour? I'd like to see this. They're not allowed to tell you that. It's actually against the law for Lawrence Livermore to say, this is the most amazing stuff we're doing. We're trying to solve fusion. Wow. Isn't that awesome? They can't even say that. All you can do is know enough to go. So there's an example of a federally funded facility that is prohibited by law from doing PR. You have to seek them out. They can never seek you out. I, I think science journalism is pretty good um, by and large. And I, I use it extensively myself as a way into the various fields that I'd like to do more extensive research in. But I'm a big advocate of science news 
uh, bi-weekly uh, periodical which you can educate yourself with just by reading every two weeks uh, and uh, over a period of years you'll be brought up to the cutting edge in all of the sciences and the, the reporters who do that work are really really good and they're not alone in this there's um, it's, it's a technical writing problem in how uh, how much do you have to explain in terms of backstory and how much detail can you go into before you lose people how mathematical can you get how quantitative so all these are, are technical writing problems, but they are being worked on, they're being solved day after day, and so just in terms of science writing, I think we are lucky in that there's a lot of really good practitioners of it right now. We've got um, a question uh, right Let me just, uh, just okay. comment on that too. A uh, big problem I have with a lot of science journalism, and um, even more so from popular journalism writing about science, is that there is a severe lack of ability among the vast majority to look at studies like a new health study and actually evaluate it correctly, to look at you know, what the significance intervals are and what the probabilities are and what other studies have said, what meta-studies have said. So every study that comes out says salt is bad for you or salt is good for you or they all contradict one another and people are very confused about it because you don't get the big picture. So maybe we need some kind of uh, Thomas Malone style collective intelligence project that some application that goes around all these publications and pounces on them and points out exactly why what they're saying is complete bullshit and don't waste your time reading it. Whereas this one maybe is plausible because it has you know, a large enough study and it's replicated enough times and so on. And of course we never hear about all the negative results as only can get published. And that's a huge drag on progress. There's a vast amount of, of research going on and all these bright minds but we could be making much better progress if we had better collective intelligence and in actually sorting through that. Um, actually, I've got an interesting concept for the, for the panel, uh, which you might all comment on. I see uploading as inevitable, and I see it coming mid-century kind of time frame. And it seems to me that, it's, that there's an enormous pressure, once you do any uploading at all, to run the uploading faster. And it looks like the, the, t the number that pretty much comes out of this is that people can run a million times faster in hardware than you can in wetware. Okay, if you're going up to this current by the mid, this is straightforward mathematics and you know physics of, of you know computational elements and such stuff. Brains run around 200 hertz. 200 megahertz is not a fast computer anymore. Long time ago. So anyway. If, if you get into severe problems on this, which I've discussed in, the, in, a, in this, that article that's in Humanity Plus, but think about this. If this thing occurs by mid-century, by the end of the century, there are people, probably some of them in this room, maybe even the majority of the people in this room, who will have experienced 50 million subjective views. How would you like, what, is, what, do, you, what do you think about those prospects? <laughs> uh, as an Ohio boy, I started to experience that anxiety when I first met my first uh, New York intellectual. So. <laughs> 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 I felt just like a trapped in amber. Um, <laughs> uh, by the way, the, one of the first uh, explorations in fiction that I know of that problem is uh, Fred Pohl, who uh, explored it, I think, back in the 80s. He started to think about it. Um, I think it's a huge problem, and uh, George Dvorsky is another uh, person who's thought deeply about the time sense uh, of people and how modulatable it might be. And it's one of the reasons why I'm actually um, much more pessimistic about the possibility that, an, uh, that any kind of machine mind would be something that we could communicate with, that um, the, the possibility space that it could range across when it gets created could be such that it sees us as you know completely static objects or uh, or, or not, and uh, but that we're going to exactly match up so that we can hold a conversation seems really unlikely. Damn you! You just my sequel now. I got to rethink this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pass this one up. Uh, Actually, I think didn't Star Trek do that before Fred Pohl? They yeah. had buzzing people and yeah, they just see them. Yeah, so fast. I don't think there will be any uploading. So it's not a problem because a we don't, we don't understand how the brain works, so we don't know what we are uploading. And we don't know exactly what we'd upload it to, and we're not just our brains; we're also our complete bodily chemical system. So without the um, the input of our hormones and of our senses, then you have um, you don't have the self anyway. It's all simulatable. 
There's the argument that we're a simulation already. Yeah, but these, the, there's arguments that we are a simulation, and maybe we are, but uh, it's like uh, they said to the Wizard of Oz, if you can do a perfect simulation that is this good, more power to you. But in fact, we don't know how it works. And the brain is probably, if you believe Penrose, or any of the people that are thinking that it's happening in microstructures, and it's probably a quantum activity that might involve entanglement, there are so many things that we don't understand physically in terms of the cosmological and the subatomic <laughs> level, uh, dark energy, uh, the, the quantum gravity problem, dark mass. We are simply uh, wandering in a mystery that we have empirically, through the power of science, uh, crept out a little bit into, but we have gone, we are still magnitude short of comprehending the brain well enough to do, to upload it. It wouldn't, and also, you, at that point, you'd be something other. So then you're talking about reincarnation novels, you're talking about immortality. You've gone from science fiction to fantasy and out of my area of competence. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question in the audience, yes, here. And we have three minutes left, so um, let's see if we can get this through the panel. Thank you. Uh, PJ, I also very much enjoyed my tour of the National Ignition Facility. It seems to me a perfect example of a top-down, highly centralized, uh, centrally controlled, large-scale uh, scientific research project completely mirrored from market forces that, as we speak, is being made uh, irrelevant by bottoms-up, networked, uh, small-scale uh, advances in energy technology. Um, so I don't have a lot of confidence in that producing anything until it splits apart and be, does a halcyon uh, molecular, i.e. splits into lots of little pieces and each of those pieces is allowed to do its own thing and uh, compete uh, in a network. That's not my question. <laughs> uh, well, we've got like a my, couple my, of minutes. My question is for Max. I presume at Alcor you make some assumptions for planning purposes about how long it will take, how many years or decades, before uh, your clients are brought back to life. It's not merely a scientific question, but also a business and financial planning question, I assume, because you have to have the right reserves to preserve them for that length of time. Correct me if I'm mistaken. And so if that is true, what, uh, what is your thinking about? how long it will take to bring those uh, clients back to life. Can we have the mic, Chayne? OK, I'll answer that very briefly because we're out of time, but I'll be happy to discuss this in detail privately. Uh, I don't really know how long it's going to take, so uh, our approach is uh, it's going to take as long as it takes, so we have to plan in perpetuity. So uh, there's all kinds of examples. Just one example I mentioned is that we have a patient care trust fund where the majority of the money paid for the procedure is put into that trust fund, which is a legally separate entity, and we never touch the capital on that, we just use the earnings. So the idea is that if it takes 100 years, 200 years, uh, over time, not only will not deplete that amount, it will actually grow, and so we should have some money ready to revive the patients if that should become possible. And there are many other aspects, but you're absolutely right, there are many managerial, financial, organizational aspects, not just technical. Anybody else want to comment on that, just briefly? No? Also, just very briefly, it will depend very much on what condition your cryo preserve. There may be some people, like our co-founder, Fred Chamberlain, who's cryo preserved this year under excellent conditions, very locally in a hospice, no delay, no problems, no problems with fusing the brain. He's going to come back a lot sooner than someone who had a brain aneurysm in Florida, where there was a delay, or someone who's autopsy. So there isn't any single answer to that question either. Thank you, panelists.